Hello, brownies and bobkins, or bobbins, to Ignore the Bird, Follow the River, a podcast where nerds and creatives talk about Willow, the Disney Plus series. I am Captain Zach, Game Master for the Iron Hearts, here on the Nerd Crafty channel. Today I'm joined by fellow nerd crafter and Willow enthusiast, Adam. Say hello, Adam. Ooh. Hello, Adam. Before watching the television show, we watched and discussed the movie Willow. Uh, we played a and d game in Mother World, all of which you can find on our YouTube channel, our podcast, and tonight we're discussing the last couple episodes, the last three episodes of the show, and if we have time, we'll talk a bit about our impressions of the show as a whole. Um, before we jump into things, if you enjoy this content, please do give us a like and subscribe. If you have a question or a comment, leave it with us here or join our discard, Discord. Find the link below and disregard what I said before. If you do, um, I'll make Adam do his <laughs> willow or brownie voice, which always brings me great joy. Oh, yeah. Hello, it's willow. <laughs> you can't give a baby black root. <laughs> and so um, it's the it's the characters like Willow that really turn a viewer into a fan. And it's the characters that players in a and d game show up for. So that's what we're going to be um, talking about, or at least I'll be bringing up a lot, is the characters of this show. And we're going to start with um, episode six of the television show. Um, I didn't take a whole lot of notes, so Adam, maybe there's <laughs> somewhere you can start for us. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, episode six entitled Prisoners of Skellen, which uh, as we find out and we kind of have a little heads up is the mines in which the trolls are and where they throw, throw, um, throw all the people that they want to subjugate in Mother World to uh, work in the mines and and create uh, create uh, wealth for for all the bath mortars out there and stuff like that. So that's basically where it is. Um, and we <clears throat> we open with um, Eric hears a voice and he tries to leave the city, but as it turns out, uh, the further he goes, he's he's thinking, oh. I, uh, I'm getting a little ways. I'm getting getting there. I'm getting there. And then as he um, goes across, a, I think he goes across a mountain or a little hill. And at the end of that hill over the horizon, he sees he's coming back to the city. So it's kind of like a one of those never-ending loops where you try to escape, but you end up right back there. Kind of like uh, anybody out there that's seen Schmigadoon. Um, it's kind of an obscure reference. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's kind of like that. You can't leave the musical until you resolve um, the turmoil. <laughs> yeah, I saw they um, they did that actually in another Disney Plus show, in the Loki show. They do that, and Loki oh, yeah. gets stuck in a time loop where Sif is punching him in the face. So it's yeah. definitely a great fantasy trope, you know. Absolutely, and and not just like it's a it's a trope worldwide, like. Fantasy, but uh, but uh, like I mentioned, musicals and and all sorts of other sorts of other genres have that have that. So it sets up the conflict. How do I get out? Yep. Um. And so then after that, the next bullet point, like basically, um, we find that uh, Willow and Kit have been captured by the trolls. And they're put into the crow's cages. So um, they're in there. There's some some weird shit going on. Like the the trolls are in there. They're like, oh no, the trolls aren't in there yet. They just wait, find themselves in the cage. And then they're looking around, and um, and they they see a few other prisoners in the cage. What did you think of the depiction of the trolls? The, um, as the, like when they, when they meet the trolls or. And they're like, like 
or just their appearance or the guy is like talking like in the movie yeah. you never see a troll talk yeah i i um what does it say oh cuz uh, like in a, in a little bit they meet the they meet those trolls and these trolls actually have names cuz i watched it a few times but i always every time i i watched it the first time without any subtitles but then i always watch it with subtitles cuz you get a little insight and stuff like that and the two trolls um his names are Cirrus and Falcon and um I just listed them as the verbose trolls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they it's a lot. Yeah, it's funny. One guy is just like very wordy and has a a huge vocabulary. He's very eloquent. Um, yeah, not just for a troll but like for any being, you know. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it's then the other guy is kind of like Argh. It threw me for a loop on first watch. I was just like, wait, the trolls can talk? Yeah. I feel like just as a storyteller, they're just like, we just need them to talk. You know, like, we can't have... We've, we've done the Star Wars Christmas special. We're not going to have people watch a bunch of hairy beasts that are talking and no one knows... <laughs> what they're saying you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah, like yeah, like, yeah we're yeah. just we're just having the trolls talk right hopefully we'll, so, we'll get over it right i'm wondering if they if they like in their minds are like okay uh these these uh daikini uh inherently understand the troll language and so they're just gonna say it in the common language so everybody can hear it Ooh. and there's no translations or or if they're just like i wonder because they're the they're the head trolls right so they're like at the top of the success ladder of trolldom. So maybe maybe they've learned a few few things uh, uh, because they have to probably meet with people that want to take the copper and whatnot away from the mines and stuff. At right? least that's I, the that's the head cannon that I'm building. <laughs> I know. They leave it to your head cannon. They there's no throwaway lines. Yeah. Or at least not that I grabbed that I caught. So yeah, I thought that was really interesting, and I think it was just to make the storytelling easier. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. But it, it adds a, I, I don't know, I kind of like that element. Like, maybe maybe in the in the trolls' uh, uh, sort of culture, like, they just, they're just sort of, because um, you don't see them a lot unless you go looking for trolls where trolls are, you know? Like in Tira's Lean, you know, like under bridges and whatnot. It's and like so, the, like maybe they're just naturally like her, hermits. They don't like talking to other people. It's <laughs> like the opposite of real life trolls, who you can always find when you're not looking. <laughs> yeah, they pop up wherever you, uh, wherever you don't, wherever you least want to see them. Exactly. <laughs> oh, which is fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what we do in the shadows addresses that too in a funny way. Um, the, the, um, I wrote down cane root and they, cause they meet, I don't know if it's before they, I think it's just before the, those two verbose trolls, uh, sort of come into the picture. Like they're talking, they're like, they see the other people in the crow's cages and they're like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, Oh, I think the guy, one guy in the in the troll's uh, cage offers them some cane root, which I'm assuming is probably sweet or something like that. And uh, he says his name's Mad Mardigan, and he's been there 10 years. And that's where we're like, oh, okay, you know, we've all been waiting to see Christian Slater in, because we all knew, like, from all, well, any any fan knew that he was going to be in it, and we're like, okay, When's it going to happen? You know, it's we're running out of episodes. And there he is in the crow's cage, just where Mad Morgan was when we met him. But um, but it's not Mad Morgan as far as we know. Um, well, we, we assume it's not Mad Morgan. But yeah, he says he says, yeah, I'm Mad Morgan. I've been here 10 years. And then the trolls pop in and then um, and then it sort of switches to a different scene. But uh, what do you think about that? Like like him? Acting as Mad Mardigan and I thought it was tasteful. I thought it was good. I feel like maybe they had maybe there were some changes 
made because they're like, oh, we want Mad Mardigan back. It's not going to work out. We need a yeah. similar kind of functioning hero. We need to do something for the Mad Mardigan <clears throat> fans. And so that's when they right. came up with the character of Allagash. Allagash, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really like what they did with, um, as we find out, later there's there you know there's more to that because we've we already know that it's associated with mad martigan and um and then allagash uh i don't remember if we heard about him before that but you know he of course is pretending to be mad martigan so um me immediately uh, my mind immediately was like oh yeah i can't wait until these two meet and see what what's going to happen and we'll find that out later on in the episode um but then as we as we go, so the party plans to rescue plans the rescue of Kit and Willow. So they're gonna go in, and um, they of course like, I mean the party's already split because part of the party's been captured, but they're gonna divide the party even further, which uh, from Dungeons and Dragons terms we all know is not always the best idea. <laughs> yeah, but rarely uh, works you out. know. So they're like, all right, we're gonna split up. We're gonna. We're gonna go. You guys go try and uh, try and check this out, and we'll go up here and try and uh, infiltrate the cages and stuff like that. So they go through, and they they do that, and then it switches. Like there's a lot. Like at the beginning, there's a lot of like sort of cut to next scene, cut to next scene, sort of thing going on. We find out that the cone or the cone, the cone, the crone. Uh, the crone taught the trolls to refine this stuff, uh, which is the orange liquid, which in my mind, I've always, I've been in, in my notes, I've been writing down as evil tang. <laughs> I like it. Um, the breakfast drink, but, uh, yeah, the, sh the crone taught them to refine it and it's, it's called vermiscus and it's basically liquid evil, which is also sort of what we saw in the um i think it was the pus that was uh coming out of Drayden's or Graydon's wounds from a previous episode when they were right. when he had got kind of sucked into the evil he got stabbed by the evil stick and then and then they were trying to exercise the demons from him but uh but yeah so it's not just the like the i guess the the copper mines that's like the the cover for the um for the the evil um the mafia for the evil mafia of mother world um yeah we're gonna we're gonna refine copper that's what we're gonna do no they're just mining liquid evil they should have awesome. had the trolls have mafia accents yeah it's just copper see <laughs> yeah what are you talking about i i don't know about this liquid <laughs> evil it's it's just copper here yeah wait wait uh, oh never mind that's just uh no it's just uh orange lava who cares don't touch it. It's hot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and then I don't know why I wrote down this. I wrote, what is that worm? I don't know. They kind of allude to the worm and we get to find out more in the next couple episodes. Yeah, 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 definitely. But I put I put that I wrote, what is that worm? And then I put they're looking for Laura, and then um. There's a there's a lot of side chats here in this in this uh, episode while they're searching for people and or like going off and um, trying to trying to fight different things and stuff like that. Um, Graydon and Alora chat on the ledge while everyone else fights, and um, I th I think he like he really wants to tell her that he's into her and he's kind of being awkward about it, but um, they're also excited about the fact that they both know how to do magic, and um, and I think he's afraid to, you know, really just tell her, hey, I'm into you. Um, but I think she understands that, but she doesn't want to mention it because it's awkward. Um, yeah, I love the, just in general, all of the character moments that this show makes sure have time and um, have time to breathe and to seem genuine because it's really only eight episodes and that's not a lot of time. And a lot of these characters show a lot of growth 
and their relationships yes. with each other change a lot, especially in between just a couple of episodes. So the mm-hmm. little moments that they have in the mines and in the next two episodes really made it enjoyable for me. You know, there were some parts that I liked, some parts that I didn't like, but the fact that they made the effort <clears throat> so it's not just a lot of fluff, because it is visually great. There's not a oh, single yeah. episode that I thought visually didn't work. All of the sets, the costumes, um, you know... Cinematography, the even mines, the CGI yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly. The mines, the, <clears throat> the, the shots where they do, where it pans down really make you feel like you're there and everything looks spot on. So I really like the character moments in in this episode and the two that follow and in the whole show. Yeah. And on the, on on that, that sort of subject, like the character moments, like this one, uh, it's, it's funny because like it kind of, it, 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 on different levels, it illustrates different things. Like, the fact that like they're actually having this conversation while everybody else is fighting around them. And it's not really a good time for this conversation, but they're having it. And it just sort of illustrates the fact that like, they're, they're a little bit younger. They don't really have a lot of experience in life in general. And they're like, they're like, Oh, well I got to address this right now. Well, even though we're in uh, uh, peril, you know, never mind the peril. Um, I'm just going to talk about this right now. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the fact that like they add in, and they do it, they do it in a humorous way as well. Like it doesn't, like when it happens, I'm like, oh god, these stupid, what? Uh, but but I'm also laughing at the same time because it's it's pretty funny, like the way that they they interject all these different things. So yeah, and it's not it's not too cheap either. There's <clears throat> you know, there's ways that it could have really fallen flat. So they're, they're yeah. pretty smart about it. It doesn't, um, I found it really funny and I'm a, uh, a big romantic. So I'm, I'm actually watching it like, Oh <laughs> my gosh, it's so important to them. And you know what? Honestly, <laughs> there's never really a good time. You just gotta, you just gotta let it out there. That's Peril true. Yeah. Otherwise. That is true. Like you, you know, if you don't say it now, maybe you won't get another chance to say it. Exactly. Um, and then, and then, you know, who knows what will happen? Uh, and it's kind of funny because, like, Alora, Alora ends up getting agitated, and the wand starts to glow. And as the wand starts to glow, and she's getting more agitated, it's kind of funny because, like, you notice that, like, the vermiscus, the liquid evil, if you will, is. Um, is reacting to her as they go through this whole thing. Um, the remiscus starts, like, as she gets agitated, it starts to boil, and then she sneezes, and it just stops boiling, which it's it's really interesting how, like, so, um, you know how the, like, very, in the very, I think it was the very first episode when they leave, I think, um, they leave uh, Tira's lean, and they go, um, they go out through the magic barrier, and the magic barrier is kind of like reacting to her. And then, not only is the, I'm assuming that's like a good magic. If there is good and evil magic, you know, I'm assuming that's the good magic. It's reacting to her, just like sort of being close to it. And and um, I don't know if it's her magic or if it's feeding off of her or what. Um, but then also the evil magic. The liquid evil is reacting to her too, like uh, not just her being near it, but like when she gets agitated, it gets agitated. When she's calm, it's calm. So, um, and I know it doesn't really get addressed um, this season, but um, I feel like in the future, in the the next yeah. couple seasons, that it's it will be addressed. Like the all all the magic in this world seems to find a, a an affinity with her. Like she's the maybe the 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 birth of magic, the embodiment of magic, the re- reincarnation of magic, you know, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> but they so pretty don't cool. address it in this episode or this season. No. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing, the t- oh, the troll. I don't know why I write notes the way I do, but I wrote, the trolls deduce that Alora is there, and their friends have come for them. 
So yeah, so the trolls the trolls realize that that Elora and and their friends have come come to to get uh, Willow and and then they're like they're out there. Oh, and 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 that's when like they're saying uh, where where um, Alagash is saying I'm Mad Mardigan and Willow's like No, you're not. And uh, Borman says uh, says you betrayed them. Um, yeah, so so that's where like the the trolls are like, oh, they're they're here now. We got to go fight, you know, because th- they they cut the scenes really interestingly, and so they're sending people out to go to go fight, and um, and then that's when they kind of come to a head, and, and Willow accuses Allagash of not being Mad Mardigan, and are they turning prisoners into Liquid Evil, or are they mining it and refining it? Do they throw people in? And turn, like, does it need souls? Does it need like, um, you know? I'm not sure. Does it need torture or right? Fear? Is it yeah, feeding off of these things, kind of like the dark side. I also wrote. I like the banter with the trolls. See, I don't know. I wasn't sold on the trolls. I wasn't a big fan of all the talking and the banter. Oh really? Oh man, no, I kind of liked it. Didn't it. work for me. Like for me, it was just just out of the ordinary enough to be like, oh, that's funny. Um, but it wasn't out. It wasn't out of the. It wasn't in that uncanny valley enough for me to be like, oh, I don't. That's we. Oh, that's creepy. Um, well, clearly it was for you though. Well, I think for me, so I liked the way I liked the costumes. I'm glad they weren't all CG trolls. Yeah. I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had it cemented in my mind that the trolls don't speak. So I just couldn't make that, that leap. And so then when they were talking a lot and like having banter and stuff, I was just like, <laughs> left a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> unenjoyable. I was just like, meh. <laughs> I don't know if they're just like trying to, I don't know if they did it for like, just, sheer uh odd humor value or if they did it also maybe because they want to show like trolls are people just like everybody else (laughs) i know there's so many and i'm i know it's brought up in previous episodes here there's so many weird kind of connotations or mixed messages that they're sending about cultures and people and so I didn't even want to go down that road, but I was just like, what are they, are they implying something here? And my, I just came to the conclusion that they just needed to move the story and it's just easier to have people talk than to work around it. <laughs> so they just went in, you know, in for a penny, in for a penny. Right. Yeah, I think so. But I did, I think my favorite part of the episode was when, um, they get to the riddles and I know we've got a ways to go, but that was, Oh yeah. That was traditional and clever. And that was, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. And that opened up a, like, I was like, Oh shit. I didn't realize you like, it, it opens up the lore of mother world uh, so mm-hmm. much more, you know, with the, with the legends of, of like the great troll or the great troll, sorry. Uh, the great, uh, Nelwyn that is like a, a crafter of things, a forger of things and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's freaking sweet. Like, yeah. Now, and it made, it made sense that it, it opened up the world in a way, in like a, like a Christmas way. You're like, oh shit. I thought I was getting this for Christmas, but I got a present that was so much better, you know? Yeah. Scorpio wants to free the slaves. Oh yeah. They have a little conflict. Like Scorpio, of course, like wants to free those slaves, wants to, like once she's in there, all the slaves are there. She's she uh, like a lot of them are probably people from you know her tribe and things like that have, that have mm-hmm. been enslaved, and she wants to go free all of them. But uh, Jade is uh, still like you know, hey, we you know like we came here to do one job and to free our friends. So um, so we got to do that first, and and so and then they split the party even further, you know. So there's that conflict. I mean, you always have that conflict and. Uh, that's part of, I think, what makes, um, if we're, I, I, I like the, the theory of, of going through this as if it's a, a D&D game and things like that. Like, that's what makes it interesting. You know, like, you have people with different opinions and, and, and different points of view. And 
if if you're playing a good character, if you're playing your character the way it should be, you pay attention to your backstory and to your your uh, traits and uh, your things like that. And you know, totally, Scorp- like Scorpio would have been that character that rushes off and does things on a you know on on a whim. Um, although with her, I don't think it's really just a whim. It's like, oh my god this is a chance to free all the people that I've been missing and, st- and more, you know? And um, I feel like it's sometimes when you're playing a game, it's, it's annoying sometimes when everybody isn't like, all right, let's do this plan all together, but it makes it so much more interesting in the long run. And in the end, you have a, uh, a more uh, full bodied story um, and storyline that goes along with it. So, so of course she goes off. Jade says, Hey, you need to choose a side. And so she does. I thought it was, um, if you're thinking in D&D terms, it's like, it's maybe the GM's character. Like, it's an NPC who is there to help the party get to a place. And then once they've gotten there, you know, there's, the spotlight needs to be saved for the main cast, for the main characters. So she, she goes her way on her own little mission. Uh, and then as the GM, it's just fun. You're like... Oh, and this is what happens. Maybe you even roll dice. You're like, I don't know if she's going to survive. Roll some (laughs) dice behind the screen. And then, you know, I think that's the funnest thing as a storyteller is to not know and to just kind of, you know, have things come to you, whether you're using dice or breaking story with a friend or inspired by watching something else. So, um, and it's a chance for her to come back changed or, you know, whether that's, um, aesthetically or internally um, or even, you know, maybe with a movie like this it's a or a TV show, it's a huge project. There's not just one person and maybe the contract doesn't go through for season two and her right. sister comes, shows up, so <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> or something true. else, that's you true. know. Yeah. So it does, it, it opens a door of possibility and, and that's just always yeah, I like that. I like that, that aspect of the way that they tell the story. It's 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 pretty like you said, maybe the contract doesn't go through. So like it opens up it opens it up so that you can you can keep this character for a long time or they might leave, but you can still further the story without like this without the story suffering, you know? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I like that. So they they cut back to the crow's cages. And Kit gets her right hand loose and helps Allagash get free. He falls. She gets loose and pulls him off the ledge. Um, so that that part was a fun little thing, like just sort of like seeing them get out of the cages and and uh, like her actually save him because who knows, like because he did you know apparently know Mad Mardigan, but like they don't they're they're not too sure about him and everything so. I just like the 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 playing off of each other, you know, like just uh, I'm a huge fan of Christian Slater um, as an actor, and he sh- totally shows up for this for this episode. Um, and, you know, just the the banter back and forth, um, you know, the will they live? Will they die? Are they going to get out? Are they not going to get out? Like it just sort of like it's just the chemistry between those actors and, and what they do with um, not just the script, but the action, you know, it just kind of, it's, it, it was a, it was a fun scene. And I think the whole time uh, in, in just one short episode, Allagash has a huge character arc, you know, it's, it's, it's just really, really interesting. I think he has a great perception change too throughout the episode. Cause the first thing you do is catch him in a lie. And then what's yeah. the second thing that happens? You find out he betrayed um, either Mad Mardigan or Borman or both. And so there's constantly this, this mystery around him about whether he's a good guy, bad guy, or yeah. going to make a good decision. You know, is he in it for himself? Is he after the, the curious? Um, Mm -hmm. so I just like the, the mystery that's, that starts with that character, but then it, it, you very quickly kind of learn that he's, 
he's going to be on the good guy's side. He's going to, when the chips are down, he's going to play the right hand, so to speak. So um, I think that was the most enjoyable thing. And, and you're right, the performance. Like, it just looks like he's having fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> he's, he's got that classic Christian Slater grin on, like, almost the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, as they're going as they're going down into the tunnel, he you we get a little little more um little more uh, sort of in input into the what you know what's going on down here because he says he says that the the tunnels lead to places far more ancient uh, than they than they have known about, and he indicates that quote unquote Mads might be in one of these tunnels. So, like, it gives us ho- a little bit of hope, like, oh, shit, Mad Mardigan might still be down there, like, he could still be alive. Um, and, like, mm-hmm. also, like, what, what are, what's this ancient, st- uh, you know, these ancient tunnels, like, what, besides possibly Mad Mardigan, like, what sort of dangers or treasures uh, lurk within those tunnels, and how long have they been sitting there, um, you know, for them to find, you know, so... So it start it you know it gives gives a little more urgency to it gives a little more a little more uh, uh, okay we can find more than just what we were originally looking for and uh, we really need to uh, go through these tunnels and search them um, kick in the door and find out what's find out what treasure we can find then they cut to another scene with um, Elora and as as they get deeper into the mine. Um, Alora starts to have sort of claustrophobic episodes is how I'm sort of describing it. They're getting deeper to the mind. Her actions or or her, sorry, her reactions to, um, you know, not to being in a confined space is actually being reflected by many earthquakes that are being caused. So, and I'm pretty sure it's, it's, it's reacting to her, um, uh, as 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 foreshadowed with the liquid evil and stuff like that reacting to her so that so it just keeps getting deep they keep get, as they keep getting deeper like these these little earthquakes keep happening and um probably doesn't make her feel any better <laughs> right yeah i don't know if she realizes that she's uh her she's directly tied to this somehow or or if or or not but uh yeah I think her her character still is in that kind of doubt. Like I think it it if it does occur to her, she's like suppressing it. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, she stays she stays pretty much in doubt until the, like the towards the very end of the last episode. Mm-hmm. I mean, she makes she makes some some leaps and bounds, but even even towards the end of the last episode, she's still com- like she's still reserved, you know. Um which is, you know, I mean, we've all been there before. I was just going to say, very understandable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, they they run into uh, they run into a group of uh, group of workers that are all in there. They, oh, because they had or, or, earlier, I forgot, we failed to mention that they had gotten into their uh, into their little costumes. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> which is they, fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's always great to get in disguise and and try and. Try and pass yourself off to get deeper into the into the um, into the den of the enemy, and then and then they like they run into some of the workers, um, and they're like, "Oh, well, there was a big mess up on such and such a level. Why don't you go and clean that up?" And he's like, "Oh, so so uh, Graydon has to go go clean up a mess." Uh, like, I just love that love that little. I mean. It's a trope that's in many, many shows and movies, but, but I, it's still, it's still funny when it happens a little bit. Like, I feel like it still is in keeping with, with Willow because they do that sort of thing in the movie, you know, just sort of like, oh shit, now I got to pretend to be this guy, and now I got to wear so much for our plan now, you know, like the plan's only good for like until until the battlefield uh, starts until the battle starts happening, so. Some kid puked in aisle five, whatever yeah. happened. <laughs> Troll toilets. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Man. Don't want to clean Talk about toilets. your liquid evil. Right. <laughs> 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 Graydon goes up to clean up the mess. Um, 
Allagash leads them through the tunnels. Um, on a ledge, Alora hears more voices. And Jade almost falls, and then Alora drops her wand, or drops the wand of Sholindria, and it falls to the chasm floor, or to the tunnel floor. So it, like, falls way down deep, like, to, like, what looks like, you know, a lake or a river of the liquid evil, but it's also, like, like it's, it's almost like a, 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 like it's iced over, but it's not really ice. So that's kind of a predicament, and uh, what is Luke Skywalker without his lightsaber, you know, like, what's, what's going to happen without the wand? Yeah, it's definitely like a, a test of her character to see how she'll react to that. This is jumping ahead a bit, but I was a little bit disappointed that she recovers it. Mm. Yeah. Like, you know, Luke Skywalker loses his hand and his lightsaber, and he builds new ones. So I was right. hoping for something like that with her character. Right. I think, um, yeah, I, at that time... I was I, I felt uh, kind of the same way, but I feel like um, later on in the I want to say it's the last episode. Um, I feel like that was just foreshadowing for what was going to happen in the last episode. Mm, yeah, that there they do um, quite a bit of foreshadowing in this show, so that's yeah. quite possible. Sometimes almost too much foreshadowing. I feel yeah, like. yeah. Like I, um, Weston and I have talked before about like. It being, okay, they want to bring Willow to a new audience. How do we bring it to them? Make it like a, like a WB, like, series sort of thing. And um, nothing against the WB, but they, like, they tend to, like, just spell it out too much sometimes. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> as much as I criticize that, a lot of times, that's for me. I'm that guy. I'm like, <laughs> oh. But you're so clever. You're a DM. <laughs> no, no, no. When I'm, I don't know. When I'm watching something, I get that tunnel vision, and I'm never thinking about oh, okay. the next step. I'm, I'm just like enraptured by it. And so, a lot of times, I need that stuff spelled out. Yeah, I can appreciate that. I've been In there. Before. Bold capital letters. <laughs> and having said that about like uh, about the WB, don't get me wrong. I enjoy my guilty w, WB pleasures like the Vampire Diaries and stuff like that. So, so those are all fun too. But, uh, but yeah. So, so that was a little bit of foreshadowing, I believe. And then they, um, then they cut back to, um, uh, with Allagash and everybody else, and um, and Allagash uh, tells a little bit more backstory about Mad Mardigan, and. Um, I didn't write down what he, <laughs> what the backstory was that he said. Yeah, my note-taking skills are the worst. I'll write down, like, a couple words, and then I'll look at it later and be like, what, what, how does this help me? What was I thinking? <laughs> not help me. So, yeah. yeah, I understand. I feel like when it talks about Mad Mardigan's background, they they still just kind of, like, it's not spelled out. They allude to certain things. Right. But it, They're just touching I got, the surface. Yeah, but I got the impression that Mad Mardigan, Allagash, and the Borman were all three working together at some point. Yes, to look for the Curus. Exactly. And then there was a betrayal, sounds like possibly on... Allagash and in some way Borman's, but Borman was actually being loyal and got imprisoned for it. Like they kind of do these reveals, and I'm <laughs> a simple minded man and I couldn't keep track of all of the betrayals and non betrayals. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, they were unsure as far as like who betrayed, who really betrayed, and whose heart was in the right place, but they were like working towards the same goal and everything like that. It just brings me back to, I think it was the previous episode where Borman tells his story of how he escaped the mines. And then they have like the thirst trap where he's washing his, washing his hair like his freaking herbal essences uh, commercial or something like that. I mean, I know, I know that that kind of a scene can be, could be kind of cringe considered, but um, 
I just thought it was like hilarious. I feel like they're making fun of cringe situations like that. And I, it was, I, to me, I thought it was very tongue in cheek and I just laughed my ass off about that. Yeah. That the character, like he's kind of a comic relief and it could have fallen flat. Like, I feel like yeah. it could have been <clears throat> cringe, but that mm-hmm. the actor, I think sells it. I think that, um, there's definitely a lot of moments where it even is kind of bordering on it, but you know, especially like by the last couple episodes like this and the next two, you're kind of expecting it from him. You know, yeah. he's, he's developed a, a reputation um, even in our minds as the audience, but I think he, he sells it and it's, <laughs> it fits, it works. It's better than like a lot of other modern Disney media where everyone's quipping. So it's nice that he's kind of sprinkled in there and it doesn't fall flat. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad that they were able to accommodate cause he had, I've, I've mentioned it before in other, other uh, ignore the bird episodes that he, he was originally contracted for wheel of time and they gave him a bigger role in willow and so he was able to work with both, and they just downsized his role in Wheel of Time. I'm really glad he got to play this part in Willow because it 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 really I think it really shows his range as an actor, and it it shows his like he's such a funny, charismatic uh, guy. You know, yeah. I really like that actor. Yeah, they're two very um, different characters. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, they. And, then, and while while uh, while Al Gash is giving a little bit more uh, exposition on the backstory of Mad Mardigan and them, um, we also discover that um, that he hates killing. Um, Al Gash hates killing, and he also hates olives. Um, so I'm I'm hoping in the in maybe he'll survive somehow. Uh, he'll, they'll come back and previous episode or uh, uh, for the next, you know, season or something like that. And, you know, find out about that. Or maybe, you know, if he didn't survive, you know, the like, we'll hear, uh, hear Borman talk about that or, or something, you know? Well, I'd imagine they would do, they would tie it into an Indiana Jones reference. And he <laughs> jumps on a Why train it- and he's like, olives. Why did it have to be be olives? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I like that. I hope that happens. (laughs) And I, I think, uh, I think his his character is also he's somewhat of a bard as well because. Oh yeah, um, I like the I like the the scene. Like it's it's next when they're when they run to the guards and he starts to sing a rhyme and just uses it to distract the guards and knocks them out and. And then we get to, oh, and this is some of the lore that he talks about, uh, the tomb of Wiggleheim. And he was buried with all of his uh, treasures, possibly the Curus. So that's what they're, that's, oh, that, I think that's, that was the uh, song, the, the little rhyme that he was talking about, that he was singing. Are we talking about a song that he sang or the, the tomb where they tell the riddles. Oh, is that the, that's, oh, okay, you're right. That's what the, uh, the spirit of, or the enchantment of the tomb says. You're right. You're right. I, I loved the, that whole yeah. sequence. I can't recall any of the details right now. I just remember thoroughly enjoying it. Like the set was very like never ending story and very like, it's not like a CG or at least if it is, they, they did a good job of it. But it, to me, it looks like a very real set, and the, the riddles are very, like, never-ending story vibe that I got from it. And it just kind of... Um, the pacing doesn't slow down to a crawl to where you're bored. It's still very enjoyable. We had some fighting before that. So I just thought that was uh, masterful. And then, you know, they actually get to solve the puzzle, and then it, it leads to <clears throat> one of my favorite things about the show, a great character moment, where, um, where Kit gets to have this kind of interaction with the spirit, 
of Mad Mardigan, um, an echo yeah. of him, maybe. Like, it's not entirely clear. I really loved that that she got to have that moment and the way for her to um, have that moment was by solving the riddle. And if, if I recall correctly, Alora Dan is the one who helps to solve the riddle. So it's kind of, you know, they've been playing this. After Kit has her moment um, and she gets the sword, she gets, she gets, uh, she finds Mad Mardigan's sword in addition to not, in, in addition to being able to talk to his spirit. She wants to go in, but Alora says you can't take anything that's not in there. Um, so, like, she can't, she can't take anything with her um, into that little portal. I, I'm calling it the Nakmar door or the Nak door, um, where she hears her dad. So, so Alora, Alora sort of talks her out of, you know, leaving, leaving everybody behind to go reunite with her father. Which mm-hmm. who knows if it's really him. Um, I think it really is. I feel like he's beyond the veil somehow on an, it, or at least on an adventure on another plane. Um, and then, so she comes back with the sword and, and, um, and they have, they have the, and then they have the, the troll confrontation. It's really interesting. Cause I was thinking, okay, the trolls are really evolved and, um, and they're, you know, they're like, there's some sort of a interesting society within the trolls. And then I discover, like, the next thing we know that one of the trolls is calling Willow a peck. So we're like, oh, shit, here's that racism again. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like you're you're even another race and you can't like you can't like get along with, us. you know, like it's just like uh, everybody wants to bash on the little people, which sucks. Mm-hmm. Um. And then Allagash comes back to help wearing the Curus. And um yeah, because because he ended up ended up getting the Curus. Um and they have they have this big fight with the trolls. Kit kills a troll, and then Allagash tells Kit Mads didn't Mads didn't kill him. Because he thought that he would see her or her brother and tell them that he went down to fight because they would protect what matters most up here, which is Alora Dannon. Right. You know, knowing that, I I feel like that kind of probably simultaneously um makes Kit feel feel good because you know her dad you know is is trying to fight the good fight he didn't just abandon them for no reason things like that but the other thing it probably makes her feel kind of a little bit bad because she's got this this complex where she thinks okay all all her father cared about was a Laura Dannon and not her or her brother you know so that that sort of thickens up the sauce in in her in her brain about about like those feelings about oh, shit. Does my dad or, dad really care about me? Does he only care about Alora? Um, yeah, the, you know. it helps stirs the pot of that jealousy and that resentment that she has for Alora Dannon, and it doesn't help that Alora is responsible for turning her away from pursuing a possible um, reunion with Mad Mardigan by having her you know, turn away from going deeper into the tunnels. Right. So all yeah. of this is, is good for adding conflict, you know, to um, giving the story more drama because we know that Alora and Kit need to, need to resolve that conflict before the yes. end of the, either the series <clears throat> or the, the season. After, after he tells her that, then he goes off and says, you guys get out of here and turns around and sacrifices himself. Or does he live? Cause we never see the body. We just see him, uh, jump into a probably unsurvivable bunch of trolls that, you know, are probably going to kill him, but who knows? Maybe he could come back in season two. And I feel like that kind of falls into this kind of 
George Lucas story where, you know, he wrote Han Solo was originally going to be, can only be redeemed through death and was supposed to die in Empire Strikes Back. Mad Marty right. is a very similar kind of character. And now um, Allagash is a mad mardigan type character so Mm -hmm. they can finally kind of fulfill that redemption only comes through death type character arc yeah and and then if it proves that the character's too enjoyable then they'll find a way to keep them around because that happens all the time um breaking bad the um Mm -hmm. was aaron paul's character was originally Uh supposed to be around for one season and everyone loved him so they kept him around yeah. So, um, yeah, I do think that we'll probably see more of that character, and I think he fit. I I thought he fit the mythos really well. He, oh yeah, he fit the the not the theme but the tone of the yes. show. It was really yeah. well done. I think, and I think, um, and for me, it probably. I already knew he, like, in my mind, I knew he would, unless, like, the directors or the writers made some weird choices, but I knew he would mm-hmm. fit in and fit that tone, uh, if if for no other reason other than the fact that uh, I've seen him in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And right? no matter whether you like that movie or whether you don't like that movie, it has the same sort of spirit that Willow does. It's just like that, a little bit of fun, a little bit of action, you know, like, uh, it's just like, sort of tongue-in-cheek and and just fun. it's a fun movie you know i absolutely that that. i thought they should have given him two daggers because i'm pretty sure that's what he uses in the in the 90s yeah. robin hood movie like as will scarlet yeah yeah just go all the way man just give him a couple of daggers reference an older brother with a terrible accent <laughs> that would have been good oh shit and then the next uh scene is another uh I feel like homage to George Lucas because how do they escape through a trash shoot? <laughs> oh yeah. There's so many <laughs> moments like that where I'm like, they know what they're doing. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So they escape through the trash shoot. Uh, they're walking across the sort of, I guess for lack of a better term, frozen over Lake of evil liquid or liquid evil. Oh, and this is where some more, uh, some more conflict inserts itself uh because kid accuses alora you know kind of like why does my dad like you better that's when like as they're as they're sort of like going back and forth i think the the liquid evil is reacting to alora's mood more and then uh some more eruptions happen and that's when kit falls through into the liquid evil and that part that's that's i like these i like these moments it, it's cool for the story but like for also for me, like the thing I love about the reason I'll always go to a big screen movie, if I could have seen this on a big screen, I would definitely go to see it. It's those cinematic moments like he she falls through and then they like they hear a voice and they're in this like this orange liquid and like they see it's like a portal like Eric Eric uh, jumps in to the liquid on the other side in the in the immemorial city and they almost touch and like, um, you know, at that point, you know, you don't know, is it, would it be a good thing if he grabbed Kit and pulled her through? Is it a bad thing? It was very, I don't know if you've seen the magicians, but it's very, very magicians to me. Like they have these pools in this certain part that like are portals to different worlds and, and it, shit like that happens and stuff. But yeah. It, and, but cinematically it was just a, beautiful scene oh yeah oh man holy shit i also liked the suddenness of the fall because you're expecting them to have this argument and she's about to really escalate the argument and then she falls through like it it, it's a it leaves this great kind of sense of incompleteness and surprise and then the episode ends shortly after that Actually, I think the episode ends before we see Eric coming through to try and save her. Oh, because okay. what? Yeah, what really it, that happens? I think at the like towards the beginning of the next episode. Because what really happens as she falls through, they cut to the next scene. Um, 
And that's when Eric had traveled many miles to try and get away from the immemorial city. And now he finds himself back where he started. He eventually just like, all right, fuck this. I'm so tired. I'm just going to drink this orange shit. And he actually starts drinking the orange, the, the evil Tang. And, um, and he, uh, and he hears a voice and he's like, what the heck? And he goes into, I'm, um, I don't know what this building is. I'm just going to call it a temple. He goes into the temple and he finds um, a pretty lady in a jail cell. And then we cut to the end of the episode with a Beach Boys tune. I can't remember what the tune was. Was it um, Good Vibrations? Or, or God Only Knows What I'd Be Without You? I can't remember what the song was, but it was interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, some of the song choices are not yeah. necessarily my favorite, but it doesn't it's not so bad that it pulls me yeah. out of it, that it detracts me yeah. from it. Yeah. The episode um, as a whole, I thought was okay. I think this episode and the episode before it are my least favorites. I feel like the first mm. three episodes and, or maybe the first two and the last two episodes are the strongest, and I really enjoyed mm-hmm. them. I think my uh, favorite episode overall was the Ghosts of Nakmar, where they get to see the flashbacks to the movie, and it's it's a uh, it messes with their minds. That was definitely my favorite. Episode. But um, yeah, this one I don't know the the trolls and. <laughs> I don't know, it just didn't work for me as well as some of the other episodes, but I, I thought it was fun. Yeah. The, I mean, I really liked the episode. I, the parts that, that Christian Slater were in, I was really, yeah. really, really into. That was, like, that was my favorite part about this episode. Um, yeah, for sure. Same. 